Hello and welcome to another video from Ellensburg Amplifier Repair and Service. My name's Todd and I'm always happy to help answer questions. So I was working on a, uh, a warranty return here for tar amps and I realized I don't have a video about a Smart 3 amplifier. So I figured I would just go over some uh, general uh, uh, tips and ideas here when it comes to repairing amplifiers. Um, I don't know these circuits inside and out, so I'm not going to go over the design of how these run or how they're smart. Um, I repair amplifiers. That's what I do. I can tell you how they drive, how the power supply runs, uh, but when it comes to the processing stuff, that just That just needs to uh, come from somebody that has the time to reverse engineer the, um, I, I don't know, call it the software end of things. But again, this is a Smart 3 amplifier. Uh, this came in uh, noted as going into protection from the owner. And uh, so I got it all tore apart. And of course, what I do is I... I always check. Let me make sure I don't have any rail voltage left here. No, my uh, rail voltage is gone. Um, safety first, guys. I'm just going to point this out right off the bat. Safety first, please. Watch your rail voltages. Because some of these boards, well, they'll pack enough punch to them to really give you a bad day. So please watch your rail voltages. Uh, use your meters, have a discharge resistor laying around somewhere, make sure you just discharge your rails. So as I normally do, I normally go through and check resistance across the terminals of the power supply, the terminals of the output transistors, and occasionally, depends on the fault, <clears throat> hint, hint, sundown, uh, the rectifiers. Uh, so that's the in my opinion the quickest and easiest way to diagnose an amplifier is just to measure resistance across the transistors a lot of people get stuck on the forward voltages of transistors but here's the thing when an amplifier fails it's gonna fail more than likely due to a short that's just uh that's just almost a given. Uh, you just have to understand how the protection circuits work and operate and what the protection circuit is uh, looking for. So most of the time you're going to have a short. And a short is presents itself the, the easiest as a resistance value. Because you can still have forward voltage leaks in, in diode mode on a shorted transistor so that's just a little that's just a little thing that i do yeah i've got the meter here so i'm just gonna show you real quick i don't know if i can get this here so i have two i went around and i checked the power supply power supply is good it read the same resistance value across the board for me um and that's that's what what I look for is you know 5k 7k 10k depends on the pull down resistors, uh, but again just remember go back to what I said a short will present itself as a low resistance value, so I was going through, and I just checked my output transistors. 6k you know 6k and 5k across these outputs, and then I came across. As I was working my way down, I came across a transistor that showed 0.67 ohms. And that just right off the bat tells you 0.67 ohms, you have a shorted transistor. Which coincides with the uh, customer statement of it going to protect because you have a shorted output. Uh, these run in uh, parallel banks of two. So uh, one was shorted and one's not shorted. And you'll see that short across the parallel bank. So don't confuse a shorted transistor 
with the whole bank being shorted because that's really not the case. Uh, you will find a single shorted transistor or in cases of parallel banks, you know, you'll have multiple failures in the bank, but usually when you have a bank in parallel and you have a massive failure, you're going to see it. So there's the shorted transistor. Uh, 12 ohms. I mean, it's across gate drain source. So it's a dead short. So this one was shorted, but yet its partner right next to it is not shorted. So, so that just goes back and tells you that it had a shorted output. And I knew right off the bat, um, with that shorted output, the next thing I do is I pull these out and then I check the resistance values again across the transistors. Again, I'm talking about the output on this smart three. So then I saw that all my resistance values were correct. The, they were the same across the board, uh, even with them, the two removed. So I knew at that point that more than likely the uh, drive I see survived. And so this was a short, not tragic enough to make these explode. So typically on these 4115s, when you have a short, they will just, they'll, they'll just internally short real quick and real sudden, but not real aggressive. They're really a neat transistor. They can handle a ton of current, but any short value in there, they short easily without severe destruction. So I installed two new 4115s in here, uh, which are located right here. These are the two new 4115s that I installed. Uh, so now I'm going to roll into the next section about this video. Uh, I get a lot of questions on how I hook up my scope. You can see the scope where I point there, right up here in the corner. You can see the scope. And then I get a lot of questions of how do I get my signal so clean? Um, there's two main things. You have to use a power source that's clean. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, some of the cleanest power sources you can get are, let me show you, these things. These things have some of the cleanest power. This is a, uh, this is a 10 amp, or yeah, this is a 10 amp, uh, 12 volt power supply. That's my 10 amp supply. So when you guys hear me say uh, I use, I'm using my 2 amp current limited or my 10 amp current limited. I have several of those underneath my workbenches here um, with leads that I swap out between my 2 amp, 10 amp, my 10 amp variable and my uh, 50 amp regulated. So uh, your input power has to be clean. You don't want to introduce any dirty signals into the amplifier. Because if the amplifier doesn't have a very good uh, filtering of its input, of its 12 volts, you're going to get that noise throughout the amp. So clean power supply. Uh, the next thing is grounding of your scope. Um, as you can see here, I don't have any jumpers. Um, you don't see any alligator clips floating around. Let me... Uh, Usually you'll see some of these wires clipped somewhere on the boards. It just depends on the type of board you're working with. Some boards require a grounded uh, input on the RCAs. Uh, it just depends on the situation of the amplifier. This one doesn't need that. Uh, my scope is grounded to the ground wire at my power supplies. So I'm coming off my ground terminal of my scope. This is the Rigol, the uh, DS1054Z. Off that ground terminal is going down to my grounds on my uh, power supplies. So I have to use a jumper between my 2 amp current limiting supply and my 10 amp current limiting supply. And since I'm grounded to my ground terminal of the amplifier, my scope is now referenced 
to the uh, zero voltage of the input supply. As you can see, there's my there's my 12 volts, and reference to ground, of course, is zero. So it's all about your uh, how clean your power is and where you're grounding your amplifier. Don't ever ground your scope. How would I put it in the easiest terms that I can think of? Don't ever ground your scope in the amp. Uh, avoid that. Don't do that. Ground your scope at the, either the negative terminal or sometimes, de again, depending on the amplifier, you got to ground your scope at the RCA ground shields. You'll know because you won't have a signal. You, uh, you're going to be missing that signal here at the scope if you don't have a proper ground reference. So that's my little tip on grounding. Next thing, I get a lot of uh, comments about, again, going back to power supplies and amplifiers. Uh, some people will be like, oh wow, you're using a two amp supply on that board? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, Oh, that board will work on two amps. Uh, two amps is that going to be enough? How you know you're getting proper signals on your two amps? Um, just uh, bear with me, and I'll try to explain this. Yes, you can fire up most boards, most amplifiers, uh, class D amplifiers. Most of them you can fire up on two amps. Uh, some of the bigger amps. Um, some of your class A, B amps, some of your bigger class D's have such large rail discharge resistors that you just can't use the two amps. It, it discharges the rails too fast. Um, but that's why I have a two amp supply right here next to me. I use every day. Two amps. Yes, you can fire an amp on two amps. And really all you're doing is you're looking for signals. The amplifier will let you know if it'll run or not run on two amps. And it's safe when it comes to current. And I'm, again, your rail voltage is built, so we're talking two different things here. Your incoming current is safe at two amps. So down below, I have a foot pedal that's uh, connected to the remote of my two amp current limited supply. I don't have a foot pedal for my 10 amp because I don't use it as often. I don't like to provide 10 amps to a board where something could be questionable. I'm more than happy to give two amps to a board that's questionable because it'll just sh it'll just shut off. So again, this is a smart three. So I'm gonna power it up and you're gonna see the lights come around. The red LEDs come around and go back around. And as you can see, we're looking good. And on the scope here, here's the gate. Let me see if I can get a better signal here. All right. So there's the drive of the new transistors I installed. There we go. So you can, as you can see, we have we have all the drives, and this is without an output attached. So one, two, one, two, and then one, two, one, two. So as you can see, I have the signals that I'm looking for based on my two amp supplies. I'm just gonna make sure nothing's heating up here. Nah, cold as can be. Just the way I like it. Um, the reason why I I like to, even though suggested, you know, on on the warranty stuff that you know you, you can't run these without a load and stuff like that but what i'm looking for because i have no load on this is i'm not pulling anything through the transistors 
I'm just looking for the switching signal because the feedback circuit is already built into the amp before the output here. So it's already getting its feedback. Sure, it's a little dirty as you can see, as you saw on the uh, signal there because there's no output. There's no load across it. But you start to recognize what type of drive signal you're looking for on the transistors before a load is attached. So since I was showing the same drive signal between the two drive ICs, that tells me I'm good to uh, reinstall the new thermal paste, get this back in the heatsink, hook up a load, and test the output signal, the sine wave. I am going to just bet there that the sine wave is going to be just fine. Um, because the only thing that failed in this amp was a single output transistor. Uh, the drive ICs, of course, had the same resistance. Again, it goes back to resistance. If you had a bad diode, a bad junction somewhere, you're going to see a, a resistance value difference between the two sides of the amplifier. So that, uh, that's generally what I wanted to cover on this board today. Uh, this is a Smart 3. I don't have a video on a Smart 3. I don't know how these Smart 3s are designed. I don't know how they... I'm not how sure how they're smart, but what I do know is they are typical Class D amplifier. Power supply, rectifiers, outputs. And those those three things, if you understand how those three things work, um, you more or less have it made. So here's the top of the Smart 3. There's other systems that are involved, of course. You know, you have your preamp, you have your processing, you have your overcurrent protection circuits. You've got a whole bunch of other things involved. But the... Th primary things about amplifier repair is going to be your power supply and your outputs. Most of the time your preamp is fine. Most of the time your um, your drive is fine per se. That's a that's a kind of a gray area. It's more of a eh, 60 to 70 percent chance that it's okay. Uh, I've had to replace many ICs, don't get me wrong. Um, but my primary goal is checking for shorted junctions. So that's what I wanted to cover here for you guys today. Um, oh, and on these Smart 3s, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. These use the... Uh, uh, let's see what rectifiers these guys use. These are using the, 16, uh, the 1620s on the rectifiers. They are using the... Wow, I can't even read that. Hold on, guys. Give me two seconds. They are using the, let me bust out my little magnifying glass here, the 180N4F6. The 180N4F6 power supplies and the uh, IRFB4115s for the outputs. And their drive ICs, of course, are the IRS. 20957s. So, uh, just giving you an idea of what these use on these Smart 3s so you have an idea of what to order up, guys. So, I do thank you for watching. Be safe. Please remember the rail voltage. Please remember to keep your fingers out of the rectifiers down here. And have a safe day. We'll catch you on the next one.